we've met before. I want to tell you what my prayer is for you tonight or today if you, as you're listening or watching this at home. My, my prayer is that God would awaken your spirit to have joy again. Uh, in, the first, in the first one, we'll read it in a second, the first guy, he has this tremendous joy about what he has and what he finds. I, I pray that God would awaken joy in your spirit again. If, if it's gone, I pray that he'd give it back to you. I, I pray that you'd rejoice and find great, great joy and, and even awe because of the treasure that God has given us in his son, Jesus. I pray that as we just sang, that, that, God, that God would lead you to say, I want nothing else but Jesus. You know, the, in, in all in the two hymns that we've sung so far, the first and the third, and then show us Christ, we're really praying, God, I want nothing else but you. And, and so I pray that you would say to everything else in the world, I want nothing else but Jesus. Um, and I, I want to walk you through that, but I want you, those are my prayers. And I want to read to you again the gospel lesson, um, just so you hear it and you get it into your hearts and minds again. Uh, the kingdom of God, Jesus says, is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy he went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. This is God's word. Would you pray with me? Oh Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. God, you are our rock and our redeemer. You have given us a great treasure in your son, Jesus. You have given us a rich treasure in the forgiveness of our sins. You have stored up for us an eternal treasure, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, and it's kept in heaven for us. So, Lord God, help us to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Set our hearts there today as we seek you and your word and, and seek this treasure that you have given us in your Son, Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to tell you some things that I think you already know. Mount Lebanon is a really special place. But I'm not talking about the building. Though this building that we have is pretty cool. When you stop to take in the stained glass windows that are on either side, when you step back and look at the architecture and the design uh, of this church that God has given us here. We certainly have a gift from our God in this place, but when I say that Mount Lebanon is a special place, I'm not talking about the building. And, and Mount Lebanon is a special place because of the people. Th this church is full of many, many dear, dear people, some whom we haven't seen back in church yet, some whom haven't been back to church yet, Mount Lebanon is a dear place because of the people, but when I say that Mount Lebanon is a special place, I'm not necessarily talking about the people, at least as the highest thing that makes this a special place. Mount Lebanon is a special place, but I'm not thinking about our ministry either. Now, this weekend, we're not doing it tonight or online, but, but in our Sunday morning service, we're going to install one of our new teachers, um, Caitlin Caesar, and we're going to pray for all of our teachers as they begin a new school year this coming week. We have a great, great ministry to students in our school. Debbie, 236 enrolled? 234 enrolled? I was off by two. I was close. We, Mount Lebanon is a special place, but I'm not so much talking about the ministry by which we serve 234 students and their families. Mount Lebanon is a special place, but not because of the people who serve here either. Um, in a couple of weeks, Mike Schussler, I don't know if you all know that yet, but Mike Schussler is going to retire as a staff minister. He's not leaving Mount Lebanon, uh, but he's going to pour into his wife and, and a life with his, his wife, his kids, his grandkids. He's going to enter retirement and still continue to serve here as, as one of us. Mount Lebanon is a dear place, but I'm not so much talking about the, the people who are here. I'm talking about the people who serve here. I'm, I'm talking about something else. And, and what I'm talking about is, is what Jesus talks to us about today in these, these two short little parables, 
You're probably thinking these are only three verses, but Pastor Borman's going to go on and on and on and on. That's Ruth is nodding your head. There are two things I want to share with you today. I want to talk to you about the treasure that we have. I want to talk to you about the response that we have to the treasure. So first, just some questions. What did this man find? If you're taking notes, what did this man find? I think the answer to that question, this will be the shortest part of the sermon, I promise. The, the first guy, he goes onto the field and he finds a treasure in a field. I don't know what you imagine. I always kind of imagine a, a pirate's treasure, a pirate's chest with all kinds of jewels and treasures in it. That's what I imagine when I, when I, when I, when I hear Jesus talking about a treasure in a field. Maybe, maybe you think of an X marks the spot. I don't know what it was. But I'll tell you this, we'll get more into this later, but this man, when he found this treasure, he had to have the field and the treasure that was in the field. So what did the man find? He found a treasure that was worth everything that he had in his life. We at least know a little bit about its value. And then Jesus told this other parable about a man, and this guy was a pearl expert, a gem expert. He, he knew his way around pearls. And, and, and when he found, he was, he was shopping for pearls, it seems like, and when he found a pearl of great price, a pearl that had tremendous value because of its size and its, I don't know if pearls have clarity, but other gems do, clarity, whatever, just flawless in every way, he, he had to have the pearl. So what did, what did they find? Well, they found this treasure, this pearl of great price. Today, I want you to ask a different question that's related what is the treasure that we have? What is the treasure that we have? And I went through a couple of those things as a church, like ministry and buildings and people and opportunities and all those things. But what is the treasure that we have? And the simple, simple answer is, what, what is the treasure that we have? It's, it's salvation. The, the true treasure of the church the true treasure of Mount Lebanon is not the building or the ministers or the servants or the people or the mission field. The true treasure of the church is the gospel. It's this, this true teaching that God has given us in, in his word about a savior who came from heaven and suffered and died and rose again. About a savior who ascended into heaven and one day he's coming back. And he's going to take all God's people to be with him. Um, if you're online and you haven't heard the message of Christianity yet, that's the very, very short story about salvation. But I want to say a little bit more, as I always do, because I want you to appreciate in a fuller way the, the salvation that we have. Because this salvation that our God has given to us I'm going to give you three words. The first word is this. It's free. The salvation that we have from our God is free. At no point in your life is God going to say you need to believe in Jesus and do this. Some people are going to say you need to believe in Jesus and check these boxes so that you can go to heaven. Some people are going to say you need to believe in Jesus and behave a certain way to get heaven. Some people are going to say that you need to do Jesus plus something to get heaven. But that's just not true. Because the truth of the matter is our salvation is absolutely free. It has no cost to us. And I think that's important for us to say today as we look at these parables. Because I don't want you to get the wrong idea. When these guys went out and sold everything they had to get the field or the pearl, we, it's, it would be easy to make the connection and say, well, now we have to sell everything we have so that we can get Jesus, or we need to do the right thing so that we can get Jesus or heaven or the treasure, but that's not the way it is. Our salvation is Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And the everything is forgiveness, eternity, treasures in heaven, a present God, a powerful God, a wise God. And it's all for free. Look, at, look again. You guys know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it's not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Your tre this treasure that God has for you in the field, he says, here, take it. It's yours. 
for free. No cost. Come by without money. That's what Isaiah says in chapter 55. Come by without money, and your soul will be satisfied with the richest affair. The treasure that we have of salvation is absolutely free. The other word I want, the next word I want to share with you is it's God gives it freely. And I know that can maybe get a little bit confusing, so let me explain. When I say God gives it for free, it means there is no cost to us. And when I say that God gives it freely, I mean that God gives it generously, that God gives it liberally, that God gives it abundantly, that God gives it lavishly. What, what I mean to say when I say that, that our salvation, God give, that it's freely given, is that God doesn't say, here you go, but he holds on to it. You know how you sometimes do that? Like you, somebody want, just wants to borrow a tool and you're like, well, okay, I know I should, but I don't really want to. Like you're, you're giving it, but you're holding on to it. Or like you're, you're, somebody asks for your help and, you're like, and you give them help, but you're like, ah, but I, you're holding on to it at the same time. When God gives it freely, he just lets go. He says, here's grace. And he gives it freely. In other words, he gives it abundantly. Paul says it this way to the Romans, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that, so that grace, this free gift of salvation, just it gets piled up and piled up and piled up and piled up. I, I, here's, a, here's a challenge for you, a Bible reading challenge. Read the Bible and notice the different ways that God talks about the abundance the over-the-top abundance of God's giving to us. There are words like abundant and lavish and grace increased. In John, he says God, grace was... He, grace, uh, God gave us grace in place of grace already given. There it is. I found it in my head. Right? God gives... This, this gift of salvation is free. It's freely given and abundantly given and... It came at a great cost, but not to us. Not to us. A tremendous cost was paid, and you already know what the answer is. There was a tremendous cost that was paid, and it was the blood of Jesus. Remember what Peter said. You were redeemed, and I'm filling in some of the things that Peter says, from death, from hell, from condemnation, from sin. You were redeemed not with gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. It was the very, Peter calls the blood of Jesus precious. And when he says precious, he means valuable. And think for a minute about the blood that was spilled on the cross. Think about the blood that was coursing through the veins of Jesus. This was not just human blood like mine and yours, but, but what, what coursed through the veins of Jesus? It was not just human blood, but God's blood. One, one historian, one Bible scholar says that he talks about this verse and he talks about the blood of, blood of God, the blood of Jesus, and he just talks about how one drop of God's blood that flowed through Jesus' veins could have saved the world, but how much of God's blood did he spell, spill? How much of Jesus' blood was poured out when he died? Not just one drop, but all of it. And that was the price. That was the cost that was paid to give this to you. Jesus paid the price, but you get the gift. Right? This, this is the treasure that we have. This is the treasure that our God has given us through his son Jesus in his word. That's part one. Part two what these guys do with it. What did these guys do? This, this, this guy walking through the fields and this guy who found a pearl, what they do with the treasure that they found? You remember, don't you? They sold everything to get this treasure. I guess when I think about this, I want to know what that conversation looked like when the guy got home and told his wife what he did. You know, he gets home and he's talking to his wife and he says, Hey, guess what? I liquidated our assets. I emptied our bank accounts. I sold everything and I got a field and there's a treasure in it. I want to know how that conversation went. 
I, I want to know how it went when the pearl, when the guy with pearls, uh, who was looking for pearls, when he went to his his uh, investment advisor and said, "You know what? Cash me out. Cash me out. I found this pearl. I gotta have it." You know, on the one hand, you can imagine the wife of the investment advisor's response, but, but I want you to think about the other side, about the guys as they told the story about what they had found. The, the first man who found this treasure in the field, did you, did you catch the emotion? It, it's not really an emotion, but you, did you catch what, was, catch what was going on in his heart? There was joy there. His heart was full of joy when he found this treasure, and his eyes, his eyes lit up. Can you imagine him telling a story? But sweetie, you don't know what I found this treasure. It's amazing. You got to see it. Come on, come on, come on. I know it's bedtime. I know our kids should be in bed, but come on, you got to see this thing. You're, you're going to love it. And, and I can imagine the pearl, the pearl market, the pearl guy saying to the advisor, you know, you, you, you've never seen a pearl like this before. If, if you saw this pearl, you would understand. If you saw this treasure, you would understand. See, there's, there's, there's two things that you see happening. There's joy, and there's a priority that's happening. These guys realize what the treasure is, and they say, Every, nothing else matters. I've got to have this treasure. I've got to have this pearl, because this, this is what I've got to have. So I want to ask you this question. What do we do? We have this treasure. What does Jesus call us to do with the treasure? And I want to help you think about it in a couple of different ways. I want to talk to you a little bit about joy. I don't know how you feel, and you're probably, like me, tired of talking about it. But, but how are you feeling right now about what you have as a child of God? Or is that something that you kind of forget during these days? I wonder sometimes if we get so consumed by what's going on in the world and what's going on around us that we forget about the treasure that we get so caught up in the pursuit of other things, or we get so caught up, so worn down by the worries of life, that the treasure is kind of buried for us in a way. And, and maybe you can think about it. I can't see your heart, but I, sometimes I wonder when we come to church, if we come with a bounce in our step and joy because we're coming to see a king and we're coming to get a treasure, I wonder how often we come and. There's no joy. Maybe coming, I know for my kids sometimes at least, it's like they're coming to get their teeth pulled. I, I had a pastor once say about just listening to a sermon, um, and he said, a sermon, and he's, he, he, he's connecting it to outreach, but he said something like, a, a church service or a sermon that looks like it's giving you a headache can hardly seem to think other it, people aren't going to want to come and be a part of that. Right? Where's, our, where's our joy? And you can only answer for yourself. So think about, am I, do I have joy because of what I have in Jesus? Because that, no matter what's going on out here, no matter what's coming in here and bombarding us on every side, that's always present. The gift we have in Jesus never goes away. The victory we have in Jesus never goes away. Let's talk about joy. And let's talk about priority. No one's ever accused me of being really, really smooth with my words. In fact, people have probably said, you don't use words carefully enough. But I have this thing about the word priority. And it's this. We talk about priorities, but I don't think that that's quite right. Because you can, you can have many, many important things in your life, but you can only have truly one priority. Because as soon as you have two things at the top, or two things near the top, one of them has to come out on top. Right? There's always this competing thing, so you can only really have one priority. And when you think about this, these parables and the priority for chasing and pursuing the gospel, do, do you see what temptations can come into our life, especially to those of us who have been in church for a long time? You know, if, if you're new to Christianity, you're like, you're, the, the, the way the Bible describes it sometimes is like 
I'm hot for Jesus. My heart is burning for Jesus. But what happens over time? There are other priorities that, that rise up in our hearts and our minds. And we start chasing things in the world. We start chasing and pursuing other things. You know, as a church, and I know these are COVID times, but something for you to think about, and for us as a church to think about as we talk about priorities is, we're a church of 375 souls, and on our best days before COVID, we averaged about 130. We're a church that says we treasure God's word, but are we? And and we say that we're a church who studies the Bible, But on a Sunday morning, this is pre-COVID, on our best Sunday, there were 30 people of the 130 who stayed for Bible study. Only you can speak to what's going on here as you think about priorities, but is that not a question as we're talking about this treasure that we have? It's a question, I think, that's worth asking. Because these guys, they forsook everything else. Or to bring in another story that, that happened, this is not a story Jesus told, but a thing that happened during Jesus' life. What did Jesus tell Mary? One thing is needful. I want to talk to you about enjoyment. And I guess I want to specifically talk to you as people who serve the church and who serve in the church, especially if you serve full-time in the gospel ministry. We use this treasure as our tool. It's, it's my job, right? It's my job on a Saturday or a Sunday or a Monday or a Tuesday or every day of the week. It's my job to tell people about Jesus. It's my job to teach the Bible. And, and for some of you, that's your job, right? It's my job to teach kids with the intent of making them, helping them to know Jesus better. And as a church, we have a ministry that's devoted to teaching Jesus. We use the treasure of the gospel as our tool. But what I want to, I want to give you a special encouragement today. Don't just use the gospel as a tool for your trade. Enjoy the gospel as a gift from your God. Because I think one of the things, and I can speak for myself in this, one of the things that happens to us in ministry is that we get so busy using the gospel that we don't take the time to enjoy the gospel. That we're really, really good at applying the balm of Gilead to other people, but we're not so good at applying it to our own selves. Doctor, heal yourself, right? So enjoy the gospel. Because what we have from our God is a treasure that saves us. That sets us free from sin and shame and guilt and hell. What I'm calling you to do and be is to become a pearl expert. There's a difference, I think, between the two parables. In the first parable, the the guy seems to be just bumbling along through a field. And all of a sudden, he he stubs his toe on a treasure. Oh, a treasure! Maybe not quite that way. The other guy, he is a pearl connoisseur. Like, he knows pearls. He's studied them. He's researched them. He's dug into them. He knows what, what the difference is between a good pearl and a cheap pearl. I'm calling you today to become a pearl expert. Not because you're going to use it, but because you want to enjoy it. I'm I'm calling you, I'm inviting you, really, to, to take Jesus and the gospel message and put it in your hand, like this man holding this fine pearl. Put it in your hand and stare at it from every angle. Stare at it and, and ponder the that word, little word forgiveness, whereby God says to you, everything that you've ever done is forgiven and gone. Look, consider that little word redemption or ransom, whereby God says to you, I, I, I plucked you and, and bought you. I paid a price so that you could be mine, so that you would be mine. 
As you come to the Lord's table tonight, ponder and hold in your hand that bread. And, and here's a little visual for you. This is totally a human thing, but it helps me think about what's happening. When you receive Jesus' body, make a, make a, make a little chair. And you're like, what? Because who is Jesus and where does he sit? He's a king. And he sits on a throne. And when you hold that little piece of bread in your hand, you're also holding your king in your hand. Your king who came from heaven to wash your sins away, to become your king, to redeem you and ransom you from every sin. And, and when you hold in your hand and you take that little cup of wine, that's your Savior's blood. That's the blood of your king who died for you. And, and that's an astounding thing. Because what do kings normally do? At least kings these days, at least the kings I know of. They send their soldiers to do their work. But what did our king do? Our king did the work. Our king came down from his throne and he died. And now he's back in his throne and he's ruling and reigning at God's right hand. So as you come tonight, as you go home and you hear and meditate and think about God's word, just hold that treasure in your gospel. Become a pearl expert and get to know this good news about your Savior, Jesus. Turn it over in your hand. Turn it over in your mouth and, and, and enjoy it. Because what we have in Jesus is a treasure that is for us now and is for us into all eternity. Amen? Amen? Now may the God of peace grant you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Amen.